today, we're privileged to have Dr. Kiran Martin speaking to us on transforming urban slum communities. And uh, this is, will be a real treat uh, for you because this really is a best practice model worldwide. And of course, we'll hear from her too about the extra challenge that the COVID pandemic has created. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce a, a, an old friend who I first met 20 years ago when I visited India and saw the ASHA project for the first time, Dr. Kiran Martin. And Dr. Martin is the founder and director of ASHA India. She studied her BMBS at, at Delhi University's Maulana Azad Medical College. She specialized in pediatrics at Lady Harding. And she responded initially to a cholera outbreak in a Delhi slum in 1988. And it was then that she began treating residents and saw the need not only for quality health care, but also to address education, empowerment, income generation, and better supporting infrastructure. So in other words, a transformation of the whole community. And this gave birth 32 years ago to the community health and development NGO that has transformed literally the lives of hundreds of thousands of slum residents. About 700,000 people in 91 slum colonies of Delhi now benefit from the work of ASHA. ASHA means hope. And Dr. Martin's achievements have been recognized by the Indian government when she was awarded the Padma Shri, which is one of the India's highest civilian awards. ASHA's work's also been praised and replicated by organizations in many countries. And, and I think it's as a best practice model that can be duplicated that, that the impact has really gone worldwide. So Dr. Kiran is the nerve center of ASHA. She envisions the strategic roadmap she provides key management input in all aspects of ASHA's endeavors. And when she returned recently from the US, she thought she was coming back to a country where the COVID pandemic was over, but arrived just two weeks before it all burst forth again. And so uh, we're delighted to have her for an hour at such a busy time when the challenges are so great. So you're very welcome here, Dr. Karen, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, over to you. So it's really good to be here. And uh, Peter and I have known each other for a very long time. Uh, and uh, I, like you said, never imagined that I would be uh, uh, completely immersed in a situation that is nothing less than sheer madness that's going on over here. And uh, there will be a point in the presentation when I will talk about a little bit about COVID. But uh, as of now, because this presentation is mainly on the ASHA model, of urban health and its social determinants. I'm going to uh, 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 go through uh, uh, that uh, primarily. So uh, there are uh, about uh, 18 million people living in the city of Delhi. It's one of the largest cities in India. And out of those 18 million, about four to five million people live in these sorts of communities. They are primarily shanty colonies and they are located by the side of either large drains like this one or they could be located right next to five-star hotels or by railway tracks or next to wealthy uh, neighborhoods and uh, they're the ones that actually contribute to the economy of the city. Just showing you a picture of a slum hut uh, it's not more than 30 to 40 square feet and this one of course has only plastic and tarpaulin as you can see. Uh, some of them are made out of brick, uh, straw, you know, any discarded material that can somehow hold the, the uh, hut together. There's uh, never any ventilation uh, usually. And uh, uh, the kitchen, as you can see, you know, the cooking goes on right there. And uh, you'll see this girl is uh, just cleaning the bottom of her little uh, baby brother. Uh, because uh, there are no uh, individual toilets, of course, and the public toilets are very difficult uh, to find and very dirty. So most people squat out in the open. There's a huge scarcity of water as well. There's for 125 households, which is uh, more than 500 people, there's only one water source. Uh, garbage disposal uh, facilities are nearly absent. So people just throw their garbage wherever there is an open uh, space uh, on any open land. And uh, even according to government figures, only 17% of them have electricity on the streets and hardly anyone has electricity in their 
homes. So they primarily live in the dark and also there are no roads inside slums and no proper drainage uh, to take care of the uh, overflowing uh, sullage water from their homes uh, and neither is there any sewage facility. So I just wanted to show you this picture because when I started my work in 1988, like Peter said, there was a cholera epidemic going on, uh, but the kids were basically not going to school. So roughly 20% of boys were going to school and 4% only of girls were going to school. And most of the kids were found uh, either rummaging in garbage like this, looking for bits of metal and plastic that they could sell or working as uh, in roadside stalls or selling new newspapers at traffic lights or shining shoes and so on. There's a whole variety of activities that they had, they were put to work uh, from through their families to bring in some additional income because of the extreme poverty that families are suffering from. This is a picture of me and this is my daughter. She was at the time only a year and a half old. She was born in 87 and I started the work uh, in August of 88 and uh, um, this man standing opposite me is a member of parliament. So the reason why I brought up this picture is to just, uh, uh, you know, uh, explain to you how important it is to uh, liaise with all the stakeholders at a very early stage if you want to be successful. And so I went about, apart from, of course, starting my work from one of those little huts that you just saw, uh, using a broken table and a chair and sitting outside, uh, with some medicines, I, I started having uh, relationships with the members of parliament and legislators and all the other stakeholders, bringing them into the slum communities so that they could see the actual conditions of the way in which people were living. And you'll be surprised that they may have been members of parliament for years on end, but never been to a slum. So when I started my work, the whole, all the slums were completely filled with local uh, medical practitioners who were basically quacks and uh, they had no degrees and there were also lots of untrained midwives conducting deliveries everywhere. The percentage of uh, 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 pregnant women who went to a hospital for delivery was uh, hardly 5 to 10 percent and uh, uh, there were no, there was no access to healthcare, uh, quality healthcare of any sort, uh, and the infant mortality rate was 100 for every thousand live births, and the child mortality was about 146 for every thousand uh, live births. So that there, there was a lot of problems with regards to health. But what I first did is, of course, apart from seeing patients myself, was to train hundreds of these community health workers, a picture of which you see here, and then they became the primary agents of healthcare in our primary care program. And uh, they then became the mainstay of being able to provide uh, preventive care as well as primary care and bring down the infant mortality rate. We have a secondary care program as well. And uh, uh, this is Dr. Sharmila on the left. And we have a, 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 a secondary care center, which has, of course, diagnostic services and other things. As you can see, we have a lab. We have ultrasound patients are waiting. And through the secondary care center, we see about 20 to 30,000 patients in a year. And uh, one good feature of this is that within two hours, a report can be obtained uh, and patients can be seen at the uh, patients can receive the report uh, possibly while the doctor is still there or, or definitely by the, by the next day. So these are all the various healthcare programs uh, at our primary care centers that are spread all over the city. Uh, you know, uh, antenatal care, I mean, our maternal mortality was 750 for 100,000 live births when we started. In the fa past five years, we've not had a single maternal death. Uh, we have a child care program where children are uh, uh, growth monitor, uh, growth monitoring takes place. You know, their vaccinations are given zinc supplements, iron and folic acid supplements. And vitamin A is again very important because it is the single most, the largest uh, cause of blindness among children in India. 
So that's a very big part of our uh, under five uh, program. Uh, and then uh, I don't know whether you are aware, but you know, there's a very high prevalence of diabetes and hypertension also in the slums. 40% of patients in the slums, uh, adult patients are suffering from hypertension and another about 25% are suffering from diabetes. So we have a special diabetes and hypertension program seen on the left. All these programs, uh, except for the secondary care are basically manned by all our nurse practitioners. Uh, on the bottom right, we have a, care, a geriatric care program at ASHA, where the elderly are taken care of. And actually, the figures for the elderly are quite shocking. Uh, you know, there are 55 million elderly people in India who sleep hungry and who live below the poverty line. And we see a lot of elderly people in the slums who are denied care, who are denied old age benefits, who are denied uh, support. So our elderly care program is divided into two parts. I won't go into the details, but basically uh, either uh, they are uh, uh, the clinic. At the clinic, we have uh, all the various uh, uh, drugs that they require and you know, uh, common ailments are treated at the clinic and then we have a community component where, whereby our community health volunteers, our ASHA volunteers and uh, you know, various other members of the ASHA team visit them in their homes and we also provide them with groceries and other kinds of assistance that they desperately need. This is our tertiary care program. We don't have a hospital, but we have formed links with various hospitals in the city. Of course, right now, uh, it's just a nightmare with nothing but COVID everywhere, including COVID patients outside hospital gates, gasping for breath and losing their lives. But in better times, we had uh, doctors from various hospitals, uh, like this doctor you see here, he's an ophthalmologist. So we've established all these different links uh, for tertiary care services, because otherwise, if patients go on their own to public hospitals, uh, they uh, it's very hard for them to get tertiary care of any good quality. So this is actually a picture of the first wave of COVID. This is not of this, because I made this presentation before the second wave hit us. Uh, and uh, we had hundreds of uh, Asha Corona warriors who were young people going from house to house and explaining the importance of masking and uh, um, social distancing. And uh, give, we, we distributed lots and lots of soap and hand sanitizer. And we started off supplementary nutrition programs for a lot of people, young children and uh, young women and uh, girls fell into severe malnutrition because of lack of food. So that's what we started. And then of course we uh, started sending uh, certain uh, categories of people. As you can see this man is elderly when the vaccination program opened and uh, we were giving out uh, food parcels by the thousands because there was a, uh, the whole uh, Asha, all the Asha communities and even the non-Asha communities uh, were suffering from hunger and malnutrition during the first wave. Now I just want to tell you very briefly what's happening. You may have seen the news uh, already and uh, during the second wave at the moment uh, there is no oxygen in the city. Uh, we have also have been desperately trying from pillar to post. We cannot even get an oxygen cylinder, let alone an oxygen concentrator. And the oxygen cylinders are being marketed in the black market where a cylinder for 850 rupees is being sold for 9,000 rupees. And people are standing all day in lines. And in fact, today, just before this presentation, only two hours before uh, I got, I'm doing telehealth and I'm explaining to my nurse practitioners how to treat patients. And there was a patient who was gasping, whose oxygen cylinder ran out. And uh, uh, the SpO2 on the pulse oximeter was 53. And my nurse was standing there and I told her, I said, you just nebulize the patient with budesonide and then repeat the nebulization. And so I gave her some instructions and she she proned her and all, and then her SPO2 started coming up and then it came up to 75 and the patient is now on uh, oral uh, high dose steroids as well as anticoagulants. So that's all we can do. We, we are not able to do anything. We can tell them to take the patient to the hospital, but there are no hospital bed, there is no ice, uh, nobody being accepted even in the ICU, nothing at all. So basically, wherever the patient is, you have to take care of them. So we have formed protocols, very clear protocols um, for primary care, secondary care, and for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for mild illness, for uh, moderate illness, and for moderately severe and then severe illness. So we are following those protocols. And one good news is that a group of doctors from Great Britain, uh, who are uh, friends of ASHA trustees, uh, Great Britain trustees, 
industries as an independent organization. They have arranged for 10 oxygen concentrators that will leave, reach us in the next 48 hours. And so at least we'll be able to provide oxygen to those patients who really need it very badly. Uh, otherwise, uh, we are doing mass distribution of masks everywhere because patients don't have enough masks. And we are also, uh, every all the warriors, these are all young people. And actually in the second wave, as you may have heard, the uh, disease is even, uh, so the young people are being uh, affected a lot. So, you know, but still in spite of that, also the young people are saying, no, we are, we, we are not going to shy away from our responsibilities. And uh, they are going out along with the ASHA team, with all the ASHA nurses, social workers, paramedics, everybody is at work in the front lines, visiting every home. And there are many, many patients of fever and many patients uh, on uh, treatment for mild to moderate COVID. And ASHA is giving all the treatment, all the medications and everything we have acquired. But the main thing is that I have no idea when this is going to come to an end. I mean, it may take months the, the way things are going. And also, I think that uh, very soon we will be requiring to give food passes because the lockdown that was there for one week has now been extended by another week till May 3rd. And I am almost certain that it will get extended again. So it's highly unlikely that this lockdown is going to lift and people are going to start going to work again. And they're all daily wage earners and they earn and eat. And so they never have more than four or five days worth of uh, savings that they can use up. So I probably will have to start giving out food parcels immediately uh, next week if the lockdown does not lift. Now I'm coming to the social determinants uh, uh, of uh, health, which I considered extremely, extremely important to address. If we wanted to see our mortality rate fall, if we wanted to see our child survival go up, if we wanted to uh, ensure that there was a, uh, that patients were healthy, people were healthy in the slum. So on the left, you see the slum lord. So when I first entered the slum, there were lots and lots of slum lords everywhere. You call them slum lords, you call them the slum mafia, uh, you know, you can call them gangsters, you know, whatever name, you know, there are so many names for them. And they're not elected, so they're basically uh, self, uh, they're just uh, self-styled and, uh, and uh, they are in, uh, they, they have very strong links with local political uh, parties as well as the political parties at the national level because all these slum dwellers have a right to vote, so the slum lords take them from their slums to the polling booths to vote. And for that, they get paid in cash and in kind. And uh, while they are uh, dreaded and feared and hated, they, they were also needed because there was no other system in the slums to help the poor. But uh, over the years, I have established women's associations. And it's such a beautiful picture on the right. Every time I see it, I feel so happy. These are the policemen and, and representative of the police that were hand in league with the slum lords and who were facilitating bribes and facilitating the oppression and exploitation of the poor. Uh, but because these women's groups are there now in such large numbers, we have thousands of women in the different slums that we are in. And uh, they form relationships with the police and they're able to resolve all kinds of problems, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's corruption, uh, whether it is crime or so many other issues for which the police is constantly uh, needed. It's also given them a great deal of confidence uh, to have this relationship uh, so that they, they, they feel a lot more secure and they feel a lot more confident in their role. And then you have all the wonderful work that these women have, have done over the years. Right now, of course, they're completely immersed in providing, uh, you know, uh, COVID appropriate behavior information and uh, distribution of masks and, uh, you know, uh, just trying to identify uh, suspected patients, et cetera, et cetera. But otherwise they were very busy trying to improve the infrastructure. And in all of these years, they've done re remarkable work in forming relationships with their legislators, as well as their sanitary officers, their uh, officers in the water bodies and officers in the uh, uh, sanitation department and so on and so forth. And uh, like, I can tell you more if you want, but uh, the situation in slums has completely, in our ASHA communities has is completely changed because there's a, uh, adequate amounts of uh, clean water, lots of toilets. I wouldn't say it's ideal because public toilets are not really ideal. 
uh, and but the garbage disposal, uh, electricity, all of these things. There's been a remarkable change, and all has happened because of these uh, the work of these thousands of women who have uh, led from the front by being empowered. And not only the infrastructure, it's also uh, resolving disputes within the community so that the police need not come and uh, work with the slum lords to uh, indulge in bribery and corruption. This is about demolitions. I'll just tell you very quickly, this is uh, the Commonwealth Games were held here in 2010. This is one example only. There have been so many of this slum being demolished in the year 2006 and uh, without any notice, without any warning, even though it's completely against Delhi's slum housing policy. And uh, my team and I had to run from pillar to post, uh, trying to get the a plot of land for them at the last minute because we were not warned and nobody knew that this demolition was going to happen. But uh, to you know, I could write a book on it. But we were able to secure the support of a number of very senior political leaders in the city, including Mrs. Sonia Gandhi herself. And finally, they got a plot of land. At that time, it was a jungle, but now they, of course, are living so nicely. And as you can see, uh, they're living in a colony that looks so beautiful. And I'm so glad that uh, you know, of course, with God's help. I mean, I'm a person of faith, and I started this work because of my faith. And I, I really am a, you know, I, I am an ardent, devout follower of Jesus. And I, I really uh, gives me great joy to see uh, what has been able to happen for the members of this community. And while we did all the hard work, I know that it could not have been possible without God's blessings. I'll just quickly tell you that uh, there wasn't a single bank account uh, in Asha when I first started. People kept their money uh, under... Uh, uh, their pillows or under mattresses or somewhere hidden in a corner in a cupboard or something and lots of time alcoholic husbands would take it away and stuff. But at this point in time, after having worked with the government of India, every single Asha family has back, not just even the family, but individuals. They all have bank accounts and uh, the, I got them loans for a variety of purposes. This is just one example uh, of a loan for opening up a shop and uh, their repayment rate is 98% even though there are no collaterals. I just want to quickly touch upon education. Uh, uh, so I, like I told you before, you know, there are millions of uh, uh, young people uh, indulging in, uh, young children indulging in child labor all over India. Like this, for example, this girl is uh, just looking again for uh, any kind of metal that she can find and she's going to put it in her sack and she's going to use a magnet to try and uh, separate it from all the other stuff. And uh, I'm, uh, when I started, I told you only 20% of boys and uh, four percent of girls were going to school at this point in time while we don't have our own school but uh, we believe in forming relationships we think that's one of the biggest keys to having a development program so we form relationships with all the local schools in the area and i'm very happy to tell you that uh, 90 percent and or even above are going to school now boys boys and girls included back then the dropout rate uh, for uh, primary school, uh, even till class five was 40%, even for those who were going. But now about 80% or so of our students are going on to secondary school. And uh, of course, the tertiary school story is uh, also another very exciting story. I'll show you another sl slide about it. After school hours, you know, just like you have boys and girls clubs or you have boy scouts or girl scouts, I, I don't know what you call them, you know, uh, uh, in the UK, but we have those uh, and they come to our uh, centers and there's a lot of different activities related to uh, healthcare, you know, uh, raising awareness on a whole variety uh, of issues and tackling social issues. And uh, also we have 12 Asha values that are to be found on our website. I won't name them, but as this is right, picture on the right is just one example of an Asha value and you know like these young children are uh, escorting a very elderly woman to the geriatric clinic uh, and so it's all about compassion and it's all about uh, expressing gratitude and kindness and understanding your self-worth and understanding your own value and uh, being able to affirm people and believing in the power of empowerment and th th there are all these different values and you can certainly have a look at them on the website. I also have a blog where I write in detail about them. 
this is our newest edition uh, you know that even during the pandemic we it was really terrible because everything went online and our slum residents didn't even have smartphones let alone anything else i mean the computer was out of the question and everything went online and they could not uh, uh, access the classes the lessons uh, like for university so we were we had to we started this it center and you know like over there one smartphone was being shared by uh, you know the whole family so we just started this is, we've got this is the first one this is the second one has already begun and now by and by hopefully by god's grace we'll have it centers in all asha communities this is our tertiary care program i am i'm telling you uh, honestly i never thought that in my lifetime uh, children whom i would see every day passing by as i would go into the slums to run my clinics and i would see them rummaging in garbage i never thought one day they would ever go to delhi university but i am happy to tell you that uh, today 3500 young people from asha communities have either already graduated or are in in delhi university uh, as of now and hundreds and hundreds of them have undergone vocational training for other types of vocational courses if they were not able to get admission or not interested this is our first international student his name is mahinder uh he we took him under our wings from when he was really young and he started uh, attending engineering college uh, here in delhi and uh, he was our first student to go to university of melbourne and he did his masters there in computer science and you can see he's standing uh, in front of macquarie which is australia's largest investment bank and he's now working and living there in australia and a wonderful asha ambassador and then we've sent uh, about uh, eight uh, eight young people to uh, australia and uh, and uh, uh, seven to australia and one to the united kingdom so that student got a chevening scholarship from the british government and went to imperial college london and did his masters in pure maths and now he's going to start his phd this is asha's internship program so this is to help them get employability to en enhance their communication skills to help them to understand professionalism in the workplace uh, enhance their uh, it skills There's so many different ways and this is the uh, the australian high commission we've got lots of internship partners uh, blue chip co companies high commissions embassies uh, uh, other ngos as well international ngos so there's a whole wide range of course right now it's all stopped because uh, of the pandemic and uh, you know we are really hoping that we'll be able to start uh, all over again uh, you know sir dominic who was the british high commissioner to india until recently uh, was one of our greatest supporters and he did a lot for our internship program and look at the difference you know between what they are doing now and what their parents were doing i mean uh, their parents were basically selling vegetables at on carts or stripping wire or uh, working in uh, some roadside stall or working as drivers or you know they were hardly earning like um, i don't know 80 pounds a month at the most and uh, you know now you have all these wonderful uh, young people who have got highly educated and are getting good jobs like working at the australian high commission working at wipro we have a lot of uh, young girls who have decided to do nursing so uh, there are many nurses lab technicians and so on in the allied health sciences also we have a lot of people and i can go on but they are they all over in multiple professions this is just a quick look at the uh, uh, you know uh, data i mean i've already mentioned to you but uh, you know our antenatal coverage is now 100% all our births almost have been attended by skilled personnel our postnatal care is also 100% i told you our maternal mortality rate is zero uh, you know most of our children have uh, breastfeeding within 6 hours of birth almost all have received dpt Uh, vitamin A supplementation also I mentioned, and hardly there are very few children who are now malnourished. Although because of the pandemic, malnutrition is again uh, going up uh, simply because of lack of food because there there is no work. So we will have to address that. Uh, but this year, you know, in twenty nineteen twenty, our maternal mort uh, our infant mortality is thirteen, and I'm really quite sometimes I'm shocked. I don't know how it happened because I know that when we calculated it. They, back then it was 100 and under 5 was 149 like i told you uh, so and this is a very quick slide to just share with you the joy and the happiness that we experienced while having so many dignitaries come and meet us it was a source of great encouragement for us 
uh, and it's also great joy for them as well. And I think that it suddenly just made us all realize our common humanity. And it was a marvelous experience to have Prince Edward, uh, Theresa May, uh, Julia Gillard was a prime minister at the time. This man is uh, the prime minister of Denmark. So this is just to give you a rough idea of, you know, uh, that th this model, you know, it's been honed over many years, but I think many governments all over the world uh, and uh, many international NGOs and many groups all over the world, even small NGOs, other groups are very keen on understanding the strategies that uh, have enabled this model to be successful. This is my last slide. And uh, this is just to talk about the Asha values. I won't go into detail, but uh, you know, uh, the, here are Hindus and Muslims and low castes and high castes and everyone is eating together. And that's a very rare sight in a slum. You will never see a Brahmin eating with an untouchable. You will never see a Hindu eating with a Muslim. So this, the whole idea of building communal harmony and being able to understand our common humanity and our sisterhood and our brotherhood is a very big idea in Asha. And it's not enough to have ideas, but has to constantly keep practicing these values so that they can become part of who we are. And that, you know, as those who have been created by God, each one can express our uh, humanity to one another in, in, in ways where there, there, there is no distinction or difference because of where we live or because of the color of our skin or uh, which family we were born in or whether we are girls or boys or any of that. So, so that is a very important part of our work. Uh, uh, and we do a lot of different things to practice communal harmony. This is my last slide. This is just so that you, if you want to register it, you can find us on Facebook, etc. all these different uh, uh, platforms. And uh, if any of you would like to make a donation uh, because uh, of the pandemic that is going on, uh, you know, we need PPE, we need N95 masks, we need surgical masks, we need pulse oximeters, we need nebulizers, we need so many different types of uh, drugs. And uh, there's a whole lot of things that we require. If you do wish to make uh, any contributions at all to the ASHA uh, efforts during this uh, terrible crisis, you can go to www asha-india.org www.asha-india.org and uh, if you wish you can make your contribution thank you so much for hearing me and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share the asha model with you thank you so much dr karen uh, absolutely amazing and i remember coming and seeing ash for the first time i think it was in 2001 when i went around at quite an early stage in the project and I was really re reduced to tears. I was completely blown away by seeing the transformation of communities and the look on people's faces and concrete streets, every house with a number on it, all the children getting uh, proper care and immunizations, the, the uh, good maternal care and so on, uh, children being schooled and uh, people beautifully dressed and turned out with electricity in their houses. And I, I came away and I, I just thought, wow, I never thought this was possible. But by God's grace, as you say, you've been able to demonstrate it and have shown us really a best practice model. And I remember asking uh, you around that time, you know, why don't you go everywhere around the world and do this? And you, you said to me, you might remember that, uh, no, we think we're called to stay here in Delhi and do it with excellence here and demonstrate to people how it can be done. And I remember Stephen Brown, Mr. Leprosy used to say, you know, you cannot meet the need but you can show how the need can be met. You cannot meet the need, but you can show how the need can be met. And what you've done through ASHA with your team is demonstrate how the needs in slum communities can be met. And anyone following these principles can do this anywhere in the world, in, in any slum community, in any city, anywhere in the world. So uh, we're gonna have a Q and A time now. Uh, I want to just come back to two things, first of all, uh, Dr. Kiran. And I remember, first of all, when I first visited in 2001, you just had your first university graduate and how exciting that was. And now you've had 3,000 who have gone through uh, university. Uh, absolutely amazing, working all around the world, uh, sh demonstrating clearly that if you provide the right pathway, people uh, will make use of it. So can you just comment a little bit more about the educational strategy within ASHA and how you managed to turn it around from people having no education at all, particularly girls, to the point now where they're able to access this? What, 
what was the method? Yeah, so uh, most of them had never heard of the word university. They had no idea what it meant. Never had they seen a college. Uh, they never seen a university uh, campus. And uh, so if you start talking to them about that, uh, they don't even know what you're saying. It's like speaking a different language. Uh, because they were all first generation learners. For generations going back, I don't know how long, none of their, uh, you know, family members had ever uh, been literate. And so there were huge barriers. First of all, the biggest barrier was in my own head, whether this can even be possible. And I remember that when I convinced a small group of people, I was, I sat in the, uh, in my meeting hall and I personally filled up their application forms, you know, because I just wanted to be sure of everything. And it was a case of convincing the children themselves. They themselves, first of all, you couldn't be convinced. If you convince the kids, then it was the parents. And of course, a lot of it has to do with their financial uh, needs. You know, they, they want the boys to immediately start earning and uh, contribute to the family income because there's so much desperation. And they see girls as burdens. I mean, the sex ratio in Delhi itself is 866 girls to 1,000 boys by the government's own admission. So it's probably going to be even less. And uh, so, uh, you know, they see them, the moment a girl is born in, in a poor family, in a slum family where I, uh, uh, you know, have seen for so many years, there's hardly any, uh, you know, rejoicing. Most people, the moment they ask the sex of the girl and you find that it's a girl, uh, you know, they, the moment they, they think about all the money they'll have to save in order to get her married. That's the first thought. So they, 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 they think of them as burdens and they just want to quickly get them married. So child marriages are very common in Islam. You know, girls getting married at 13, 14 is also very common. So to convince families of sending boys and girls to university, like three more years, you know, even after coming to class 12, that was like a huge deal. And I think it's only when you have a certain cohort and a certain momentum and people begin to see, and especially when they see them getting good jobs and they see them totally different, looking so different, speaking English, you know, uh, looking so dignified, so smart, you know, and they walk about the slum streets. Uh, it just makes everybody wonder, you know, that maybe this is not this, we should think about this. So there are so many different obstacles we had to overcome. And of course, not least the, the money that you need to pay for their uh, university tuition. I mean, they could not have afforded it uh, unless Asha had paid for it. So there are lots of obstacles and we overcame all, all those obstacles by and by. And even now there are, you know, so, so you know, it's, a, it's going to be a long journey. Yeah. Now, uh, absolutely key to the Asha program is empowerment. It's one of your values and, and particularly the empowerment of women through education, through, through training, through helping them to be a voice as well. And I remember you talking about what a big breakthrough it was when you gave women titles to their land, yes. because before that, the slum lords could just come along and bulldoze everything and they had no rights at all. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that, the battle to get women land titles and how that transformed the situation? Yeah, absolutely. So I was in, I was dialoguing with the slum department, you know, saying that uh, if we don't give them some sort of land titles, that they have no motivation to improve their homes and they're always going to live in this little shack and uh, after all you know they're contributors to the city's economy and so they have a right to some of the city's land and of course they can't pay for it but you know they must get titles and so we decided to do this one uh, project as a pilot and actually I think you may have seen it's just behind our headquarters and uh, so as we discussed things we felt that it's really important for women to get uh, the title because there was a lot of alcoholism, there was a lot of drugs and we felt that uh, if men got the land titles, uh, then they might uh, take loans, they might mortgage their homes, they might uh, you know, use them as collaterals to loan sharks, all sorts of things would be possible and then their wives and children would be out on the streets again. But it was really difficult because it's a very patriarchal and a very feudal society in India and owning land is only a male thing. It's a very rare thing for a poor woman to own land. Even in villages, the lands are always owned by the men, not by the women. They feel like once a woman is married, their responsibility is over. Now she's the wife of her husband and the husband will own the land and look after her and the children. So it was a very uphill task and uh, it almost didn't happen, but we convinced them and finally 
all the land titles were given in the name of the female in the in the household which was uh, you know a revolutionary thing uh, it had never happened before and uh, i mean i'm happy to tell you that uh, it became part of the government's policy after that because they saw that uh, you know the houses were not sold people were still living in them even 10 years later and not only were they living in them they had improved them made them look more beautiful like i showed you in that picture now advocacy has been uh, right at the heart of your work too and uh, you you made friends with mps uh, even with slum lords with uh, police who were taking bribes to protect the slum lords and so on I remember you describing uh, women going along and sitting in government offices, uh, demanding, uh, you know, concrete latrine covers and that kind of thing. And and people did respond to it. And and the the uh, those with authority and power began to see it was actually in their interest to be kind <laughs> to the people living in the slums. Can you just say a little bit about advocacy and how you 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 trained and and helped? women especially to be able to stand up for their legal rights and make use of the of the facilities that were available to them if they were to ask in the right way yeah actually you know i think there are two key words here that one must uh, remember while performing uh, the advocacy tasks one is uh, relationships and the other one is non violence because uh, if you are going to use the weapon of violence you can only make more enemies already everyone is your enemy there are the wealthy who don't want you there there are the mlas and the mps who only want your votes they're not interested in talking to you uh, uh, four to six months before the elections you really don't have any friends in the city and so the idea was to help them understand that in me whatever we do we must do through a non violent approach and it must be non violence not just of action but non violence of words we must approach them uh, through relationship uh, through befriending them because we must separate the doer from the deed we know that the doer is an evil man we know that the slum lord is uh, you know uh, taking full advantage advantage of you he wants your money he wants to exploit you he wants to oppress you and you hate him from your heart because of all that he's done you know in the past and you also hate all the politicians because everybody knows that you know they come with their handkerchiefs over their noses just before elections and uh, and they come and ask for votes and so everybody knows everybody in the slum knows how the whole thing operates you know so i said we have to make it different because otherwise uh, we are never really going to uh, be able to become friends with these people you know so the whole idea was to uh, go again and again persevere in your efforts uh, and like i remember when i went with a few women in the early years they the women were so scared that they didn't know how to sit on a chair so i had to make them practice how to sit on a chair and then when they went to the gate the, the security guard wouldn't let them in and somehow i found a way for them to come in and then the slum commissioner said well why have you brought all these people you know i can talk to just you but then i very nicely explained to him why it was important for them to be there so it's been a very long and difficult journey but it's yeah. wonderful to see how once they understand their collective uh, bargaining power through the through relationships and through goodwill and through creating uh, you know opportunities uh, uh, in the way in non violent ways and not uh, by exercising any form of violence all of these different methods but plus of course you have to build their capacity and train them etc they need a lot of training uh, in various forms of advocacy so all that has resulted in tremendous success and the best part is that like you rightly said it's in everyone's interest you know the the legislator can now come there with more happiness because he knows he won't be uh, abused you know the member of parliament will also be warmly welcomed the slum is much cleaner so he doesn't feel bad about coming there and then he also knows or she also knows that next time they will get votes uh, from the community because they have stood with them du during all those years and the slum lord is somebody you can't wish away he's always going to be there so if you aren't going to befriend him then it's a non starter you'll not be able to do anything in the community so it's in everyone's interest to have this approach yeah now a question from dr ariparel who's a a pediatrician um who who from the uk who's asking so it's excellent presentation we've got family in india uh, and they've been ch very challenging religious beliefs and superstitions around covid have you any advice from your experience on how to provide health education in communities which have strong religious spiritual or cultural understandings of health and disease that might not be helpful in this context 
I mean, I can fully understand where uh, the doctor is coming from. Uh, so, you know, uh, Muslims are very reluctant. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know which religion, but I'm just saying in general, Muslims are very reluctant to take the vaccine because they've got certain myths around the contents of the vaccine. Uh, there are a million myths going, uh, going around about the blood clot, you know, that's, that, the, the, the very, very rare uh, side effect that is seen with uh, AstraZeneca uh, that yeah. has frightened people. So, yes, there are a lot of myths and superstitions and there are no shortcuts. You know, you just have to uh, have... Uh, and then there are a lot of TV programs, to be fair, you know, where round tables of doctors are on every day on, on national yeah. television explaining, uh, you know, how to do away with these myths and superstitions and what is right and what is not right. So, I would say that instead of going to WhatsApp instead of, uh, you know, WhatsApp is full of uh, a lot of fake news. So instead of relying on all these sources, it's much better to listen to health professionals who are giving good advice on television. Yeah. Great. Um, Shari Falkenheimer from CMDA US, uh, who uh, was speaking here a couple of weeks ago, actually, on mobilizing teams to work abroad. She's just asking, how is ASHA funded? So we've got friends of Asha bodies in different parts of the world. Uh, there's one in Great Britain, there's one in Ireland, uh, one in Australia, and one in America. So these are the four friends of Asha organizations, and they're run locally by the people living in that country, and they keep on performing fundraising events for Asha in many different ways. And in addition, we also keep applying for grants to foundations or grant-making agencies. Uh, but I would say that the vast um, majority of funding comes from smaller donations of people who are really committed to the vision of Asha and to the work of Asha and who've been very long-term supporters and who also, some many of whom would like, uh, who have been making monthly contributions uh, from uh, from many years. So I think that, uh, uh, you know, in all my years also, I, I also feel like, you know, if you have, if you're sharing the vision, uh, you know, with from your heart, you know, those, those are not just contributions. They are much more than just contributions. And uh, I've seen that, you know, people who are committed to your work and to you and to your vision uh, through relationships will stand with you in the worst of times, like they are right now, you know, and like maybe some agency may come and go and you know they may not be able to help you you know during a crisis they may be able to may they may not be able to help you but i think people with whom you share your vision and relationships that you form for many years uh, you know even if a small contribution means everything in the world yeah now uh Tim Tusick is asking about a book to read and Ted Lancaster who's a very good friend of yours in fact it was Ted Ted, who first told me about you and the work of Asha and introduced uh, me to you uh, when I first came out to India and saw your work. So, so Ted is suggesting that the book Urban Health and Development, Macmillan 2001, which I think you wrote together, and but he's also rather cheekily asking, back to the book, uh, Dr. Kiran, what about another edition after COVID has improved? So I'll leave you to... <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you to think about that, but we will put we'll put a link to urban health and development in the letter that we send out to people tomorrow. And I'll leave you to get in touch with with Ted and talk about a second edition uh, for the book. Now, um, a question now from Angra Gray. Many thanks now to referring to your own personal faith and your love for Jesus as a major motivator in your work. Uh, what are there any mental health or pastoral care, in other words, spiritual care workers in the slum working with you, in addition to the physical nutrition hygiene care provision uh, that's helping these social communities to improve? Yeah, so I mean, we don't have pastors as such working in our slum communities. Uh, a lot of our team members are uh, very ardent and devout disciples of Jesus, you know, and they, of course, uh, you know, have a, a whole lot of different ways in which they share their faith uh, within the context of the work that we do. Uh, there are many people who are very interested uh, in, in, you know, a Sunday uh, meeting that they want to go to. And then what we do typically is direct them to something that we know to be very, uh, you know, authentic and something that we ourselves believe in. And then a lot of them have actually started going to those places and receiving a lot of blessing by going there. 
so it's like a mixed bag you know there's not but but we certainly don't feel that it is in our place to hire pastors and or chaplain like figures and have them you know working yeah. in asha but as you say you have lots of christians on the staff and in the, exactly. in the slums anyway who are being salt and light in that situation yeah so yeah. Dr. Ken Van Mar Marfian is asking in that connection, says, thank you for the presentation. Do you require non-Christian staff for this work? And if so, how do you communicate the values that underlie your organization? And I know you do have staff who are of all faiths. Yeah, absolutely. We minister to people of all faiths and we have staff also of all faiths. And uh, I think that the values are a wonderful foundation uh, to be able to have a common understanding of the image of God, you know, and what he really stands for, his own relationship with humanity and how he uh, has designed for us to live in order for us to flourish and in order for us to experience that abundant life. And I think those values uh, are something that when practiced, and I've seen that when they're practiced by people of any faith, uh, you know, uh, there seems to be so much joy, there seems to be so much enthusiasm, so much energy, so much passion, uh, you know, and uh, a spirit of celebration, you know, uh, and always, uh, there's, there's always uh, energy to do all the things that Asha is uh, uh, wanting to do because of the values, you know, because yeah. they're so central to everything uh, that we do, you know, like yeah. affirmation, for example, I mean, it's a human, it's a human need, just like food and water. So, you know, for us to be able to affirm one another is absolutely critical to Asha. So if there's somebody who may not be of the Christian faith, but if you're affirming them, if you're, you know, uh, publicly and privately also affirming them, it gives them so much energy, you know, and so much, they become, you know, so much more motivated. So I think that that spirit, you know, which God has given us is to be shared with everyone. Mm -hmm. And so whoever comes on board becomes a member of the Asha family. Yeah, I, I went to that. So uh, some questions about specific uh, illnesses or, or health needs now. So Mike Soderling, who is Soderling, who is the lead for Lausanne on global health and uh, very involved in this whole area, he's, he's asking, what was done to train sufficient birth attendants? Did you start a school of midwifery? Or was it community training? How, how did you do that? Yeah, we had, uh, we basically had community training and we uh, linked up with a government uh, of not one, in fact, many government centers uh, because they had to perform deliveries uh, and they had to perform at least uh, five deliveries to be able to get a certificate uh, under government supervision. So we basically followed the protocols that the government had laid out for midwifery training and did it in collaboration with them. All the uh, classes and everything was done in the community and the practical training was done in the hospital. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Naravoni is saying, uh, thanks again for your presentation. For hypertension and diabetes projects, which you mentioned there, uh, and how common those two problems were, do you give free treatment for patients? And uh, if not, uh, if, if so, where do you get the financial support? Is it from government, from NGOs, uh, or from donations? How, how do you fund the work for hypertension and diabetes? I mean, we considered this area about five years ago to be very critical because the prevalence of hypertension and diabetes in our population was shockingly high. So we felt it was absolutely critical to intervene. And so we 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 designed a very very good program for these uh, both these uh, chronic diseases. And all the uh, funding uh, is obtained from individual donors or foundations. And we don't charge our patients anything for this because it's a long-term disease and uh, the drugs are quite expensive. Patients cannot afford. Then there will be uh, a lack of compliance and uh, we don't want to see all that. So we, uh, have, we, we are not charging anything for uh, our uh, diabetes and hypertension programs. Now we have listeners today, probably from over 40 countries, and many of those are in Africa. A uh, question Dr. Tobias here is asking, uh, how do you collaborate with other countries? Kenya, for example, he says, has got many slum dwellers. We need people like you. Can we collaborate? So if, if people are seeing your model, being inspired by it, wanting to duplicate it in their own situations, 
what steps should they go through in terms of learning from your experience? So uh, first thing is that I would like to say that I've been to Kenya and uh, Ted mentioned this book, Urban Health and Development. And uh, one of the countries that we visited in order to gather uh, experience on a global scale was Kenya. So I visited the slums of Nairobi very uh, extensively, uh, but it was some years ago and tried to get a good understanding. And a lot of the uh, experiences are found in that book. Uh, when it comes to uh, helping people in that country, even from then and all the way through till now, many groups have contacted us over the past. And we've had collaborative relationships to the extent that they would come and spend some time with us. I'm talking pre-COVID, they would come and spend time with us and uh, immerse themselves in uh, the uh, program for a certain number of weeks. And uh, we would uh, be able to uh, help them uh, try to understand how they can start a program uh, in, in their own context. And that has happened on numerous occasions. So yeah. once uh, COVID is behind us, and, and if uh, anyone from Africa is interested, they can definitely get in touch with us and we can work things yeah. out. And I, I just to back that up, I'd say, I mean, you've heard a marvelous presentation today, um, but if you if you actually go and see it and talk to the staff, talk to the people in the communities, you will you'll get a, a much fuller perspective of what what can be done and how miracles like this are really possible and the steps on which to embark. Can I just ask, uh, in terms of specific treatments, we haven't talked much about COVID at all. You say there's no oxygen yet. You're hoping to get oxygen concentrators uh, soon in the next week or so. You, you've talked about prone nursing, about dexamethasone. Are you using any other drugs apart from that? I, I know that there's a lot of publicity around things that might not work, but there are other things that for which there's some evidence, like uh, uh, ivermectin, for example. Are you using any other drugs apart from steroids? Yeah, and so how me, really available are they? Yeah, so let me explain that uh, my, uh, you know, after doing, seeing all the protocols and everything, uh, my understanding is that until day five, it is the virus that is causing the symptoms. And if on day six, if the patient is getting worse, then it is not the virus, it is the inflammatory response in the body, the cytokine storm and all that, that is actually causing okay. the patient to yeah. get worse. So what we do is we very carefully monitor day-wise because, you know, once you apply an oximeter, it is only when 60% of the lung capacity has been lost that you will see a drop in the oximeter reading. You're not going to see it. So this pulse oxy, pulse oxy business roaming around and keeping your finger in the pulse oxy again and again to see, you're wasting a lot of time. So okay. we go by days rather than by the oxy reading. So okay. if on the sixth day, if the patient has high fever or if the patient is breathless or his symptoms are worsening, we immediately start them on anticoagulants because we know what happens when there's an inflammatory response. The alveoli, uh, uh, the, in the minor blood vessels, there's clotting. And for all of those reasons, the, the uh, 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 patient starts getting breathless and desperately needing oxygen. So on day six, we start them on Eliquis, five milligram twice a day. And we give them uh, methyl prednisolone, 40 milligrams, three times a day. And we nebulize them with budesonide respuse every six hours. And then, of course, there's proning. And there's very good hydration to the maximum extent. Of course, and then we keep on treating them based on the symptoms. Uh, when it comes to ivermectin, we are giving ivermectin 12 milligram on day one and on day four to all uh, people at risk. Uh, such as our warriors uh, and our healthcare workers because ivermectin is in great short supply. If I was able to get ivermectin in bulk, I would have liked to give it on day one and day four every month for the foreseeable six to eight months to the entire population. But I'm not giving up. I still feel that if I can lay my hands on I ivermectin, I, I would like to give it to everyone. And uh, I believe that if we are able to be very good with counting of days and giving this intervention on day six at the right time, we will not come to a point when we require oxygen. Yeah. A lot of people are uh, keeping oxygen cylinders at home. A lot of people are keeping uh, concentrators at home just because they are misinformed, they don't know, or they're too scared that, you know, something happens, what are we going to do then? That's why they've gone completely out of the market and they've disappeared. Uh, we are not advocating rem Remdesivir 
uh, at home uh, there are many private practitioners who are <laughs> prescribing injection and <laughs> and that's why that's also disappeared from the market and there is no evidence to demonstrate uh, that it's a life saving drug so uh, we are not giving remdesivir in asha it's not even available and even if it was we would not like to give it in asha dr kum we've nearly run out of time we probably have run out of time but let me just give you one last question from dr yeah. caleb here and He's at, well, he's got two questions, actually, but you can answer them both. So the first one is just about the whole decision making structure. Do you have a team? Is there a second in command? Just tell us a little bit about the leadership and governance. And then his second question is he's asking, is there a lot of prayer that goes behind this? It seems it, it was such a Goliath scale that you've kept going and not given up. And oh, he's got a third question. What makes you not give up? I think so. <laughs> so, to, so just the leadership team, uh, the role of prayer, and and really what keeps you going? What gets you out of bed in the morning and and makes you not give up against such obstacles and difficulties? And then we'll. No, finish. I mean, with regards to leadership, uh, we are a staff of approximately hundred, but we then have. Uh, you know, many, many warriors and other volunteers uh, who join us in our efforts, primarily from the slums. So if you were to count all the women and all the young people and all the children, then of course it goes into several hundreds. And even they have to be managed, as you can imagine. So we've got a structure in place. Of course, there's the director who I, who's me, then we have an associate director, and then we have managers, and then we have program officers, and then under the program officers, we have program assistants, and then under then we have team leaders. For every team there's a team leader and under the team leader is the team and uh, and then of course uh, the team leader is not only responsible for the team but is also responsible for the volunteers that are working alongside with that team there's a separate finance separate admin team uh, a separate communications team communications and fundraising team so these are all the different teams and of course we have a large polyclinic staff with dr shanmila there and you know our radiologist and ultrasonologist and all those people yeah. whose pictures i showed you uh, and uh, and uh, so uh, you what was your uh, one was of course the leadership question uh, and then yeah it was and it was particularly also about decision making in the in the thing i guess so decisions are made at different levels by different yeah. people with different yeah. levels of responsibility yeah. yeah yeah so uh you know we have empowered our teams uh just like we empower our women you know we first have to empower uh, exercise the empowerment uh value within our own uh you know organization so uh, i am uh, mostly not involved in day-to-day -day things uh but i do believe that it's very important for a leader to go to the front lines during times of crisis mm -hmm. and to go now and then uh, so that you always have your pulse on the work and you don't ever get far removed from your work so i make it a habit to go quite regularly to the various asha communities and these days in crisis it is totally critical to go because everyone gets really motivated and inspired and then everybody is re ready to fight you know at the front line otherwise on a day to day basis there's lots of people here all of whom can take independent decisions so much so that if i take a team leader and a team and i put them in a new slum and ask them to start a community health and development program i'm telling you they'll be able to do it completely independently yeah and then uh, there was the role of prayer was the yes, second part yes absolutely yeah. so you know all the friends of asha in different countries they have different ways of organizing prayer some of them uh, so we send out a prayer letter i don't know whether you ever receive it but we send out a prayer letter in the first week of every month generally yeah i, I get it yeah you do you get it so yeah. so all the all you know people pray individually when they see the letter or they form groups friends of asha for example friends of asha great britain have a uh, i think they meet once in every two weeks uh, so they themselves have formed their own prayer group and uh, they uh, do it on zoom so in that way before the pandemic a lot of them were having groups in their own homes as well uh, so you know i i think that <laughs> that really is the reason why 33 years later you know we are so enthusiastic and you know so full of energy uh, yeah. you know and god has just been so faithful to us and uh, i think that you know when he talks about i have come that you might have life and have it in abundance yeah. i really believe that i yeah. really he, he really is the giver of the he is the giver of life you know and he you know because he himself said if you have the sun you have life yeah. and life in abundance you know so uh, i am not one who can so easily be uh, 
uh, you know um, told that you know nothing is possible. <laughs> yeah. you know, and so, I, and so the, the the last question was uh, of his questions was what makes you not give up? You know, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What makes you persevere against great obstacles? Your I mean, like word. you know, I I I mostly find. Uh, that if you approach an obstacle, uh, you know, with perseverance, you know, and determination and courage and faith, you usually overcome it. You know, there are so many obstacles I found with slum lord. You know, I could have been killed even by now. People told me you'll get, you'll die if you go, <laughs> you know, in this situation. But I feel like you know, there's something up, uh, there's there's something wonderful about the, you know, values that you know Christ has taught us and. When we exercise those, we form. There's a lot of goodwill and good relationships all around. And yes, there will be times when you feel maybe this challenge will never be met. But I don't know. I just somehow feel as though uh, I would rather look at God than look around me. You know, because the moment you look around you, like even now, everyone told me there's going to be no oxygen from anywhere. Literally everyone. I said I don't care. I'm not going to listen to people around me. I don't want to listen to all these voices because I'll get disheartened, which I don't want. Because, like I told you, there are patients. I'm, I was talking to a patient, uh, my nurse, even two hours before this. So, but then see, when I looked at God, uh, He answered. Right, the yeah. oxygen concentrators were purchased, and they're yeah. going to arrive in forty-eight hours. So, you know, I think that I would rather believe in Him than believe all the voices that are discouraging and disheartening. <laughs> so it's listening to the voice of God and and looking in the face of. God in Jesus Christ is a great motivator. Uh, Dr. Kiran, thank you so much for your time. We must let you get back to your work now because we've already held you longer than we promised we, we would. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kiran. Thank you to our, our four translators, Daniel, Michael, Maria, and Hernda for your work, for Josh, for his IT wizardry behind the scenes and to all of you for coming along listening today. Please spread the word about this webinar, get it out, tell others about it. And we look forward to seeing you again uh, soon on ICMDA webinars. God bless you all. Thank you.